Thanks everyone for joining. Um, our session is about proactive Kubernetes security, how we can uh, use runtime anomaly detection in Kubernetes with uh, the open source tool Kubescape. So I'm uh, Remy, I'm the head of cloud platform engineering at uh, Alterdomus, and I'm kind of leading uh, the efforts of Alterdomus of application modernization, you know, hosting everything on Kubernetes. We have a multi-cloud environment, so all of the, the aspects that come to that, the complexity, etc. cetera, uh, we're trying to, to manage that into a unified way, let's say. And uh, I'm here with my friend Amit. Yeah, so I'm Amit, I work at Armo uh, as a security researcher. We are the maintainers of Kubescape, which is a CNCF uh, sandbox project that is uh, uh, going to be incubating uh, hopefully soon. And uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about how Kubescape uh, elevates runtime security in uh, Remy's company. <laughs> Awesome, and so the agenda for our talk is I'm gonna give a little bit of a background story on uh, how we met, how we uh, got the idea for this talk, uh, also about the, the, the value proposition of uh, the runtime anomaly detection. Uh, and then Amit will say a little bit on how Kubescape actually solves that problem, provides an answer to it. And then um, I will go to a live demo where we can uh, get hands on with the tech and see uh, how it, uh, how it works. So a little bit of background information. Um, so at KubeCon this year, I actually met with uh, Ben Hirschberg, the CTO of Armo, um, and we were talking about um, one of the projects that he was uh, working on at the time still called KubeCop, which um, kind of combines several aspects to bring context uh, about runtime capabilities one of the things is a cap profiler, which Amit will tell you about. Um, but yeah, from, from my experience, I've been using Kubescape quite some time already, mostly from a Kubernetes um, configuration and misconfiguration detection. And we had kind of this, um, I'm not gonna say gap, because we, we, we had a tool that already uh, did some runtime uh, detection. But since we are a multi-cloud environment, and sometimes we, tended to rely a little bit on cloud-specific services. Um, we had some, yeah, let's say problem statements um, and kind of, yeah, hard requirements for our runtime uh, detection tools. The issue with most of runtime detection tools is, and you may or may not know this, but it tends to create a lot of false positives. Like a lot of the rule sets for the, let's say, I'm not gonna say legacy, but your typical runtime detection uh, tools use kind of a generalized rule set, which isn't tailor made to your workload, which hasn't been learning the capabilities that your workload is doing. And is kind of, um, to me, the reason why it's not that contextualized and almost a little bit irrelevant for most workloads. And as an outcome of that, we get a lot of false positives. You get alert fatigue. Um, it becomes very hard to find a true positive. And on top of that, um, the context building is really needed to tackle security from a multi-layered approach, both to um, facilitate prevention, so giving you the, the, the key information so that you can actually configure your preventative um, methods or configuration, as well as the detection and response uh, dimension. So I think that, that I always like to um, compare it with in my, in my old days, uh, almost a decade ago, I used to be a firewall engineer. And uh, when, when some application teams uh, requested some rules, you know, it's always trial and error. Oh, we need uh, maybe uh, SSH open. Oh, but we need this open as well. And then we need this. So in my old days, I, I used to work with Palo Alto and you had like this kind of transparent mode where you could have the firewall learn whatever traffic was, uh, let's say normal behavior or expected. You could tell the application teams like, test your stuff, I will inspect it in a transparent way and then we can generate a rule set on this. So this is actually, you will see what I mean, certainly in the demo and with what Amit has to say, how this relates to it. And so in our talk with, at KubeCon with Ben, um, 
he kind of said, oh, look at this project. Uh, they have actually since then integrated it in the Cubescape node agent. And so this is really um, something that uh, was very interesting and that we decided to uh, pursue. Hence why we are doing this talk right now. Yep, so um, how did we solve the problem in Cubescape? Um, so as Remy said, uh, like we felt there is uh, a bit of a gap today in runtime detection tools in, in cloud native environments. So we decided to take like a different approach and just look on what other products are doing, you know, in today cloud environments, you know, maybe you've heard of tools like Falco and Tetragon and Tracy and other, uh, you know, those sort of tools. And we've also decided to take a look on other tools which are uh, less popular in, in, in cloud environment and are less like an endpoint security tools. And we wanted to see like what's the best outcome we can get by looking on all of the options. So we started by taking a look on the more mature products, uh, antiviruses and EDRs uh, and those types of products, and the way they detect malwares and viruses. So uh, we found that they are still the, the most reliable way to detect malware is by using those sort of tools, okay? Like if you take a look on today, cloud environment, uh, cloud native tools, they can detect some malicious activity, you know, opening a reverse shell or, or touching like a sensitive file, but they are less strong in detecting specific malware, right? So for example, if you take the most popular crypto miner today that attackers installed on uh, Kubernetes environment, uh, it's called XMRig, which is like a, a normal crypto miner for mining Monero, but it's like really easy uh, to install it uh, in Kubernetes. And if you think about how you would go about detecting this type of crypto miner, then there are several ways, but uh, today cloud tools uh, doesn't really detect it re re very well. Like they can detect some signature, some maybe new process being spawned, but they won't tell you you have this crypto miner. They, they, they can't really have a good detection. And those types of tools like antiviruses, et cetera, are really good at it. So, uh, but the problem we encountered uh, with these types of tools is that uh, they consume a lot of resources. And as you'll know, in cloud, we don't have a lot of resources and everything needs to be very efficient. And the way those tools work is, you know, uh, with the other rules and uh, byte pattern scanning and signature databases. And because of the dynamics of the environments, uh, we find it uh, quite hard to implement those types of tools in Kubernetes. Uh, I will say that we did a successful POC uh, with an open source antivirus, and if we'll have time at the end of the talk, I'm gonna touch on it. But uh, we decided we need something else. So uh, in about mid of uh, uh, 2023, uh, we created in uh, Armo uh, a project called Cup Profiler, Kubernetes uh, Profiler. And what it basically does is utilizes eBPF in order to profile applications so we can provide better uh, posture and compliance uh, for uh, people that are using Cubescape. So if you think about it, one of the major challenges today in Kubernetes, for example, is if you want to auto-generate uh, network policies, right? Uh, it's very hard to generate network policies for your entire cluster if you don't have any uh, technology that knows how to generate it for you. The same with, uh, goes for second profile. And the same goes for uh, compliance issues, like uh, saying if you have a privileged uh, workload, then uh, all the compliance tools will tell you, uh, don't put it privileged, uh, turn it to false, but most of the time it will break your application, right? Because what if your applications do need some privileged capabilities? So what we did is create something called an application profile, which records application behavior for, uh, let's say, 24 hours, uh, detect things like processes, network, etc., and then utilizes this information in order to do posture. And then we thought, why not take it also for runtime? Uh, but in runtime, we can do uh, two interesting uh, things. So uh, the final solution we came with is to utilize this application profile, which uh, composes of processes, file activity, system calls, permissions, and network activity. And together we created a runtime detection tool inside Cubescape, um, which we divided into two. So application profile-based security agent and uh, behavioral inspection. 
So uh, application profile-based security agent is basically taking all the learned information from the application profile, which was already being used for uh, uh, building you uh, uh, network policies and second profiles. And now we can enforce anomaly detection on top of this application profile. And in addition to that, we can also uh, save you a lot of false positive, right? Uh, and we're gonna see uh, an example for that in a minute. And in addition to that, uh, we still integrated uh, custom rules and like behavioral inspection rules, for example, to detect reverse shares and fileless execution in memory and, that, and those types of attack, which are not anomaly detection, but are also important to detect. And we think this is a very optimal solution because if any of you uh, use like Falco and other tools, uh, usually it, like, it comes with a lot of configuration that you need to make in order to make them effective. So uh, we feel like this is a very good zero configuration tool because once you install Cubescape, it automatically starts to learn your environment, automatically enforcing the behavioral inspection tools. And once we have uh, uh, the application profiles, the learned uh, uh, data, then we can enforce those rules more efficiently and save you a lot of false positives. Uh, and with that, we reduce the alert fatigue. And with that, you get a better security, right? Because it's uh, like, as an attacker, it's very hard to bypass anomaly detection uh, uh, tools because you're doing anomalies. <laughs> okay, so, so let's talk about an example of why this is useful. Um, one of the common things uh, like in Kubernetes is that by default, uh, service account token is being mounted into pods, right? Like if you didn't follow the, the good practice of, of compliance that tells you to, not, uh, to, to turn this flag to false in your YAML, so that the service account token is not going to be mounted, uh, by default it, it is being mounted. And using this service account token, an attacker, an attacker can talk to the control plane, and to, like to the API server, and uh, for example, uh, do kubectl get secrets, and supply that service account token. So as a user, you, like if you have a runtime uh, detection tool, you want it to give you an alert when someone is accessing this service account token. But the thing is that some applications utilize this token for legitimate use cases. And if you don't have an application profile, if you don't learn the environment and the behavioral of workloads, then it will be a false positive. And this is what we see that is very common today in random detection tools, that if they don't learn the, the dynamics of the environment, they give you a lot of false positives, such as uh, this type of alert. So a bit about the architecture. Um, so again, we use eBPF in order to trace the information. And then we divide it into two. The first part is building the application profiles. And we're going to touch a bit more about those types of objects, which are uh, API, uh, uh, Kubernetes API uh, types of objects, like similar to CRDs. And uh, the, sec the second part is the detection engine, which has all the uh, custom rules, also the anomaly detection rules, and the behavioral inspection rules. And once the application profiles are ready, the detection engine uh, uh, starts to utilize them as well. And finally, uh, we support uh, uh, exporting all the alerts into many different types of, of, of uh, uh, like output. You can use Alert Manager, you can have it as an HTTP, you can have it as STD out, you can have it to syslog, whatever you want. So it's very convenient uh, to work with those alerts even like inside the, the open source of Kubescape. Yep. All right, and so for the demo, uh, a bit of uh, detail. So we have a Kubernetes cluster running on which Kubescape is installed via Flux. I'll tell you a bit more about that later. And then we will have kind of a, a mock application, let's say, a ping app, which is very vulnerable, um, just to showcase um, the, 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 value, the value of the runtime uh, detection and the anomaly detection. And then we have an alert manager uh, spinning up to, to show what Amit just said, um, that those uh, alerts can be forwarded to whatever you want, in this case, uh, alert manager. So a little bit more about the value of Flux um, for this. So Kubescape has Helm charts. Um, but yeah, at Alterdome, is, uh, at least we like to use pool-based GitOps. Firstly, because it, faci uh, it facilitates self-service, but also it increases the reproducibility for our uh, multi-cloud environment. So in this case, um, 
the, 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 the value of uh, using GitOps with Flux for Cubescape is that it's easy to deploy, but also um, the artifacts that it's, it's, is produced by Cubescape, like the app profiles and also the runtime rule alert binding, we can actually put them in our Flux repo and we can move them uh, towards the upper environments. So for instance, you could have a non-production cluster running on which you validate your, uh, your workloads, maybe do some QA testing, etc. You capture the application profile and then you apply it in production without having to do the learning in your production cluster. So keeping it more safe um, from that end. So just um, guiding you a little bit through our Flux repo. So we have Cubescape. Um, actually what you can configure here, this is what uh, Amit touched on. You have the learning period, which is very nice. In this case, for the demo, we put it to two minutes uh, with a one minute refresh interval because we want to you know, get things uh, done. But you could very well imagine that you put it on uh, 24 hours or even longer if you want your QA teams to validate an application end to end and then say, okay, this is um, the, the, the final, let's say, uh, set of behaviors that we expect we lock it down and then we can use that application profile in the future. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna deploy a demo workload. So I have a demo workload namespace, very uh, convenient. And here in my Flux, uh, I have the ping up YAML, which is commented. So Flux should be able to do a good job of deploying this. Let's watch the namespace. And let's uncomment this and commit the changes. Of course, this is a demo environment, so I commit directly to the main branch. And then let's see um, if we can do some, uh, let's say, behavior that is intended within the two minute learning period so that the application profile can get generated. Um, so let's just wait until the pod gets deployed and then we'll do some uh, normal behavior so the application profile can learn it. Of course, always a little aspect of praying to the demo gods that uh, Flux works. <laughs> you could always reconcile it, but I like to have Flux do its magic. There it is, always trust, uh, trust Flux. <laughs> so now I'm gonna port forward it, so I can access it, and I'm gonna do something that is unexpected behavior. In this case, I'm going to ping um, 1.1.1.1, which is Cloudflare, uh, in this very vulnerable application that doesn't do any backend site verification, you will see in the later steps. But in this case, this is expected behavior, and uh, in the backend, uh, Cubescape is generating an application profile. And if I'm quick, I can actually show you what's happening. So in this case, um, it's an incomplete application profile because it's actually initializing. So it's learning the behavior of the demo ping app. And you can see now not a lot of things are uh, populated. We have a couple syscalls but we don't have the file paths, we don't have the arguments, we don't have the network streams that are working. So this is initializing. And while this is initializing, I will let Amit talk a little bit more about what an application profile actually is. Yeah, so um, as we said, like application profiles are CSD compliant uh, 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 objects and are also very convenient uh, to use in Kubernetes environment. So, um, a bit about the architecture in Cubescape. So we actually implemented our very own storage uh, uh, in Cubescape so that we store Kubernetes objects like CRDs and, and, and uh, API extensions uh, objects inside this storage. So an application profile is, uh, uh, is one like that. And also the runtime rule alert binding, which is the object that allows you to bind rules to workloads using uh, default like Kubernetes selectors. So it's very convenient as well. So again, application profile, uh, uh, is based off uh, processes, files, 
networking system calls and the capabilities, like Linux capabilities. And that way we can also tell you, for example, if you're using privileged workload, we can tell you, turn off this privileged workload, but use capability, uh, for example, if you're loading an eBPF program, then use CAPSIS BPF instead. Um, and we found that 24 hours learning period is like a good balance uh, between security and, and, and efficiency because like sometimes you have uh, cron jobs or other types of, of jobs and 24 hours uh, we found it uh, pretty good. Um, as we said, Kubernetes API extension objects, CICD compliant, and we have uh, something called object states. So for example, if you think about it, if you install Kubescape and there are already running workloads in the, in the environment, so we didn't learn the entire behavior of those workloads, right? Because they started and worked before uh, you installed Kubescape. So we mark those uh, application profiles as partial application profiles. And if we learn the behavior of, of the workload from the beginning, uh, then it's completed. And having do, those two modes uh, allows us to be more dynamic with the uh, alerting we are doing because uh, if, if we are going to send alert on partial objects, on partial application profiles, we are again going to make a, a lot of false positives. So this is why we have this marking. And we're gonna see it in the, in the ping up, but this is like, maybe it's a bit of small, but uh, this is like the structure of application profile. You can see it's a Kubernetes object. It has all the uh, things we talked about, and let's just see the application profile of the ping up if it's yep. finished learning. So by now it should be finished learning. Let's see if what the status is. So we see already a lot more. So we see a, a path-based access, etc. And actually if we look at the exec, you can see it here. It actually learned that the ping 1.1.1.1 is um, yeah, normal behavior. So it fingerprinted that behavior into the application profile and you can see now that the status is completed. And indeed, like Amit said, the completion and status is, is different. For instance, if you have a pod that is running but uh, has some init containers, etc., cetera, uh, Kubescape needs to look at the whole life cycle. So then it will mark it as partial because it didn't see those init containers and couldn't profile those. But in this case, this is a very simple um, application and the application profile is fully complete. So now that we have this um, application profile, we can start uh, hacking away uh, on the not so secure application. So I'm just gonna make sure that I'm forwarding uh, alert manager, yes I am. So you can see here, uh, we only have uh, alerts on the Kubescape namespace. This is because the learning peri period is so small, I believe. But let's um, hack a little bit in this, um, yeah, no backend verification uh, kind of a mocking application. So for instance, I could do a ls, basically escape um, the string that I'm pinging and do a command line injection. So in this case, you will see that um, this is not behavior that was captured by the application profile, and this is an anomaly. So you can see here, I can uh, list index and ping.php. And if we refresh here, you can see there is a rule uh, that was violated, which is an unexpected process. Because again, Kubescape didn't uh, saw this behavior when we applied the learning period. And we can go further, of course, now that we know that we can do an LS, we can probably do a lot of nicer things. So let's see if we can cut the service account token. As Amit said, it's not a, a best practice to mount the service uh, account token, but some pods have to do it. Sometimes um, you can't get around it. So in this case, let's see what this will uh, give us. This, it's a little bit slow, oh, it's okay. So we can actually cut the service account token. Uh, please, no screenshots. But uh, <laughs> let's see in the alert manager what it did. So firstly, it detects the cut as an unexpected process again, but it also sees that it's unexpected service account token access. So again, these are two alerts, and actually you don't really need to aggregate them, but this is part of one flow. Um, and this is, I'm just saying that because context is important. Having these alerts as a singular event might not give you a lot, but when you combine them into like an attack path analysis, 
you get the full picture. So let's see how far we can get it. We know that now we can cut uh, the service account token. So let's download kubectl uh, binary. And then let's see if we can execute some nice things with it. And again, this is a very insecure application. I wouldn't recommend yeah. it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but this is just for demo purposes. So you see that here we curled uh, the, the, the binary install. Uh, so alert manager should have picked up firstly the curl. Um, so you will see here, this is an unexpected process. And then we can take it one step further. We can first make the binary executable. So again, Kubescape will see this as an anomaly because changing the permission of a binary wasn't something that uh, we did in the learning period, which is also a fingerprint of an attacker trying to tamper with your environment, of course. And so in this case, you will see the actual uh, permission change that was detected. And then finally, we can, and this is, you could do uh, way more exotic things, but let's just use the binary now that we downloaded and let's just list the pods using the service account token as an authentication. And this should be all bells ringing, you know, if, if this happens in your environment. Um, so let's see here. And what do we get? We actually get a kubectl output of get pods. So this is the proof of a uh, yeah, concept that kind of works and in the alerts, one thing that I find very valuable in this uh, specific one, so firstly, it sees, of course, kubectl was launched, which is unexpected. Again, wasn't observed in the learning period. But to me, one of the most important ones here is exact binary that wasn't in the base image. This alert alone, this should be like, you know, your uh, whatever alert manager should be read, all the screens should be read because this is really somebody's uh, added, you know? So this is, um, this concludes the demo. I'm happy the demo got very happy. Um, but you can see this is very easy to set up. Um, you have the value, you have the alerts. Firstly, also from the app um, profile, you can generate second profiles, app armor profiles to prevent things. But then once you have the behavior locked in, the alerting is very relevant. You don't get a lot of um, false uh, positives and it's, it's really, um, yeah, valuable. So that's it. Let's go back to the slides. Because I think, Amit, we still have time for your yeah. Clamavi CVE. Yeah, so um, before we touch in this slide, so uh, if you want to use uh, Cubescape, like we saw, so we have uh, many rules, not just we, uh, what we saw in the demo. Um, so we can just go to Cubescape.io and, uh, and read some documentation, visit the, the repo, and also leave a star. We are really close to 10K, by the way. So uh, we'll appreciate that. And as I said in the beginning, uh, we wanted to integrate uh, some sort of scanning, which we feel is a bit missing today in cloud, which is the type of scanning an, an antivirus would do which is like Yara rules and byte pattern scanning and signature database. So um, we want to see if we can get a quick win and find some open source antivirus maybe. And I am guess uh, some of you heard, some of you didn't on a claim AV, which is an open source antivirus uh, uh, by Cisco. And from what I've seen, this is like uh, the only open source one. So shout out to them. Um, but. You know, Clem AV isn't considered to be a very good uh, uh, antivirus, <laughs> as some of you may know. Uh, and so what we did is actually uh, cre we created our very own signature database, which is, which is uh, tailored to Kubernetes uh, to have like better signatures there. And uh, we have successfully implemented Clem AV as part of our agent. Uh, this is not by default because this is still in beta, but uh, this option is, is possible and it works pretty well. And, and one of the things is that, as I said, ClamAV has some problems. So uh, while looking at ClamAV, uh, and, and as I said, we want to be very uh, uh, good at uh, resource consumption. 
So, and ClamAV, uh, we installed it, and immediately we saw uh, two gigabytes of uh, memory being used by ClamAV. And then I was like, why? So, I started digging into ClamAV code. Uh, it's written in C, just looking on some files, uh, and I wanted to see what he's allocating, like why he's allocating so much memory. So, uh, looking at some files, and then immediately I saw a line, uh, slash bin, slash sage, and then it takes uh, uh, like a formatting string. And my background is offensive security, and I was like, oh, there, <laughs> I might can control that formatting. And so, uh, this is how I found a CV in ClamAV. Uh, so, ClamAV has this feature called virus event, which is basically a, a configuration you can configure in ClamAV, uh, that if he uh, finds a, a virus, for example, then uh, you can run a command. So as you can see in the, in the first line, you can configure virus event, and then you have uh, uh, two formatting, like percent %v for the signature name, like if it's, if it's found a crypto miner, then you'll get the, the exact signature that he found. And then the percent %f is the name of the virus. And like typical use of that would be maybe to send an SMS, to, to, to the uh, response team or to send an email. Uh, but if you think about it, uh, an attacker uh, controls the file name, right? So if, if, if I'm putting a virus in your environment, the, I control the file name. And the percent %f is being formatted there. So what I've did is I've taken the XMRig uh, crypto miner, as I've told you in the beginning, and I renamed it to be a command injection payload. Uh, like we did in the ping up. So as you can see, like this is the, the final formatting that will happen after we uh, called our virus with the command injection uh, uh, payload. And finally, in the output, you can see below uh, that it detected the signature, printed the string, and finally, uh, I got my UMI uh, root uh, at the end. Yeah, thanks. So uh, this is like a QCV and yeah, some, some security tools have holes in them. It's also something. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Yeah, I think this shows that uh, your security tooling deserves to be secured the most because uh, usually it's uh, highly privileged because it can do a lot of things. So when that gets compromised, you typically don't detect it and you have a lot of impact. But uh, this is a nice CV. Yo, and by the way, uh, ClamAV is mostly used for uh, email servers, usually. So uh, many companies, even Cisco, even Google, etc., they put ClamAV on their email servers to scan files that are uh, passing through that mail server. So the thing is, like, you can just send an email with, with, the, with this payload on the virus name and execute code on the mail server, which is really cool. And many servers are not patched. But I will tell that this is not the default configuration, this uh, uh, virus event, so not all of the uh, unpatched versions are uh, vulnerable to that. Uh, yeah, if you have uh, any questions, feel free. Yeah. Does Kubescape need to be terminated? So no, Kubescape can work uh, offline. Uh, you can put it on as a, you can use it as a CLI tool, like in your CI/CD environment, and you can use it as an in-cluster component. So, um, is it possible to conveniently manage a large number of executable files? Sorry again. Uh, is it possible to conveniently manage large number of application profiles? Okay, so he was asking if it's uh, easy to, to manage a large number of application profiles. Um, so, so again, uh, application profiles are, are uh, like Kubernetes objects, just as like pods or, or any other object. So uh, you can manage them that way, but usually uh, Kubescape will handle them for you. So you don't really need to mess with them too much unless you really want to. But maybe Remy as a user yeah, can. Yeah, if you want to actively manage them, the way I showed you via GitOps, if you have like an Argo CD or Flux, uh, you can actually manage them across environments. Uh, so they are fully CI CD compliant. So you can just apply them uh, to any of the clusters. You don't really need it to be learned on the same cluster. You can just apply it. And to us, at least, Flux or any GitOps tool uh, is the way to go to manage uh, um, things like that. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yep. Uh, do the application profiles take into account time or instances of accessing a particular resource? So like when the pod launches, it might need to use um, uh, credentials to talk to the, the cube API at the beginning within like the first three seconds. But if you access it after that, it would throw a violation or maybe if it reads, um, reads a file more than a number of times, like first, first one occurrence would be okay and then a second occurrence would be a violation. Does it, do we have those types of features? Yes, so this is a good question. Um, currently we don't support uh, uh, this, like we just, once we recorded uh, a behavior, we, we assume the application needs that behavior, but uh, it can be an upgrade <laughs> for the future. That's a good point. Nice one. Yep. Yeah, so what you can do is, uh, for example, uh, when you install a new version of your application, uh, so we will uh, relearn the behavior, and you can uh, modify the application profiles or restart the pod itself, or like restart the workload, uh, do a rollout, whatever, so we, we relearn the, the behavior. Yeah. Yes. So he was asking if an uh, application profile is by, like if I understand correctly, is by the pod and not by the image? Okay, so basically uh, what we do is that if you have many pods, you know, it's running like uh, with its own image, we usually aggregate the application profile to the workload level. So if you have, I don't know, three pods, but they are part of the same deployment, then we aggregate the application profile for the whole deployment and we uh, like, we combine all the, the behavior of the, those pods.